Hey guys, welcome to the Cole Cast. Today we have a special episode, part two of Andy Davis Hammer in 2023. Today we're going to see Andrew Larson with Rob Hughes striking. He's going to talk about his process, the how and why of what he does, what he does. And uh, I think it's really worth listening to this. His, again, process centered step by step by step. So it's going to be a great listen. You need to listen to the whole thing. Thank you so much for checking it out. I hope you enjoy it. All right, I think we'll get started here. If everyone's here. My name is Andrew Larson. I am a tool maker and a blacksmith from Western Kentucky. Um, here today, we're gonna demonstrate a couple different things. First thing we're gonna demonstrate is a, a rounding hammer. Um, most of you have probably heard of a rounding hammer. Most of you probably have one. Um, some of you have probably made them. We're gonna demonstrate it in a way not only to show you how to make a rounding hammer, but to give you an idea that you can apply to other things you may make. Um, this, this is the hammer we're going to make, if you want to pass this around. This is what we're starting with. We're starting with a three and a half pound billet, uh, slightly more than that, accounting for material lost while grinding and while forging. This is, the steel is 1045. Uh, you can find 1045 in most machine shops, um, hydraulic shaft, and such. It's a water hardening steel. This is two inch round by, I believe this is four and a half inches long. We have a piece in the fire heating up. So, I'm gonna be making this hammer with a striker. Rob Huff is gonna be striking for me. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna say hi. We're gonna be making this hammer with what we call the sequence. The sequence is a set number of hits. This hammer, subtracting the hits taken to punch the hole and release the hammer from the drift, this hammer is going to take 102 hits to make. What does that mean? That means that this hammer is not only repeatable because I know how many hits it's gonna take and I know when those hits are gonna be taken, but it's also teachable. Okay, I can take this hammer which I may consider an ideal form for a rounding hammer, and I can show it to you, a student, someone watching a demonstration, and this may not be the ideal form of a rounding hammer. You may not like it. Um, you may not understand what the ideal form of a rounding hammer may be. That's not teachable. I can't teach you what something should look like, but I can teach you how many times to hit it. And if I have a sequence, that is a set number of hits in a set places and a set number of heats, that's teachable, that's repeatable. So that's what we're gonna be doing. Um, this can be carried on to other, any other forge you may be doing. For instance, if you are drawing a taper, if you're making 100 tapers uh, for 100 coat hooks, per se, you can develop a sequence, do it in a certain number of hits, and then it's gonna be a repeatable process. You're gonna be real, able to repeat that process over and over and over. And it's gonna be the same product every time. So that's what we're doing here. This hammer is gonna take, like I said, outside of punching the eye, because I, I can't put a number on that. It's done when it's done. Right? We, your striker's gonna strike a little harder, a little lighter. Piece is gonna be hotter, colder. You can't put a number on that. So that's out. Releasing it off of the drift and upsetting it, we also can't put a number on because there we're looking for a certain form. I want to shorten it, I want to forge the ends of the eye, and you'll see all this later. So subtracting those hits, this is gonna take 102 hits. And it's going to take 10 heats to do. So it's 10 heats, 102 hits, and this is a three and a half pound rounding hammer. Almost ready. Before we start, does anyone have any questions? How many have you made now, Andrew? Hammers? I don't know. Probably approaching 2,000. Somewhere 1,500 to 2,000, probably. I'm assuming in your shop, if you're by yourself, you use the same methodology with power oh. forging tools. Okay, so. This methodology with power forging tools, yes. I use a sequence when I'm making hammers with a power hammer. In my own shop, I use power equipment to make hammers. 
uh, and tools in general. I use a sequence, but it is not this sequence, okay? That's one thing. If you go to make hammers, a rounding hammer, whatever it may be, don't feel like you have to use this sequence. You can use your own. You can figure, this sequence is what we've determined to be the minimum amount of hits and the minimum amount of work to make a rounding hammer in a class, teaching it, etc. Come up with your own. Figure out what you like as far as a form is and make a sequence to that. Whatever you want to do. Like I said, the sequence, a sequence can apply to anything. Uh, when we make, we make trivets and do scroll work, the ends of those scrolls are tapered in what's called a ribbon taper. And those must all be the same so that they all line up properly and it all looks nice and appealing to the eye. You have to use a sequence for that. Yes, you could, you could hit it till it looks right, but to be efficient in forging, you should use a sequence, in my opinion. Anybody else? So, you, you, like, like, you, like you asked, um, under a power hammer, I do use a sequence. Um, this is, but this particular sequence is what we teach in classes for the rounding hammer. We have, for most of these tools, a sequence. Okay, the striking end of these tools takes 12 hits, okay, a set number of hits, um, stuff like that. Drawing down the shank for a hardy tool to fit in the hardy hole should be eight hits done properly. Just some examples. So the first thing that we're gonna do here is we're gonna punch the eye. I'm gonna take this piece out of the fire. It's gonna be hot. I have a hammer eye punch. I'm going to hold a square, a speed square. This is about right around half, set at half of the length of the billet. I'm gonna hold that on the piece. Rob is going to scribe it. I'm going to flip it. He's gonna scribe it again. What that does for me is gives me two lines that I can divide in half by eye. I've got four and a half inches. It's hard to divide that in half accurately by eye. So I'm gonna lessen those marks down to maybe a quarter of an inch. I can divide that in half by eye. As far as side to side, width ways, getting it centered, it does not matter because we're using round stock. All I have to do if it's going off is tilt the billet a little bit, right? It's round, it can roll. All I have to do is tilt it. If I'm using square stock, depending on how wide, I may scribe side to side as well to find a center in that direction. Ready? One thing you may notice, um, Throughout this process, this anvil is going to move a little bit and some tools will probably fall off of here. Typically, I would bolt this anvil down. Um, Logan would not let me bolt the anvil down. So that's Logan's fault. So stuff falls off of here, that's what's going on. Rob is going to scribe, I'm going to flip, and he's going to scribe again. It's about a half of an inch. I'm going to divide that in half by I. I have a mark. Okay, we're, we're not hitting hard yet. We're trying to develop a properly punched straight I. We have a tip on the end of this punch that is a V shape. And what I want to happen before I have Rob start hitting harder is the shoulders of that punch be buried into the material. That's about now. We're gonna start hitting a little harder. Notice the punch comes out easily every time. That's because I'm not leaving the punch in the hole for long. It's not heating up and I'm pulling it right out immediately. I'm also 
floating the punch in the hole. I'm not pressing it all the way to the bottom. When it starts to get stuck a little bit, I can give it a little tap like that. It releases it. You'll probably see on the anvil here a little green coating developing. That's because the piece of steel we're using here is hydraulic shaft. Hydraulic shaft has a coating on it that when heated up burns off like that. So we're getting colder now. The center of this piece of steel is still warmer than the outside. And the center is primarily where we are moving material. So I can keep going a little bit. We'll probably call it there. So for the first heat, we are about three quarters of the way through a piece of material. probably saw this tool come off of the handle. Uh, I'll explain why real quick. All these tools, all these top tools that get struck with a hammer are not wedged in and the eyes are a single taper. I'll explain that more in a minute when we start drifting the eye of this hammer. A single taper means that my ham handle can just be a single taper and fit all the way through the eye. Not having a wedge means the handle is not tight, so there's not as much shock going into the handle. And when the handle is destroyed, which is quite often on these top tools, I can very easily make another one, not have to worry about wedging it in or any of that. So all these handles are just friction fit like that. Um, that's why throughout use, I will tap them like that to reset the handle down. And one may come off at some point. Does anybody have any questions about what you just saw? I don't know if that means we're doing good or bad. When you're punching the hole, it's very how deep that you go from the first side okay. before you go to the second side. So when punching a hole through something like this, um, or anything else you're punching a hole from, as most of you should know, you do not go all the way through one side and come out the other side. You go a certain amount through, turn it over, and come back. That's gonna punch a slug out. On hammers, I like to go about 80 to 90% of the way through. On most other things, um, a bottle opener, a coat hook, anything like that, I will go about 90% of the way through before I turn it over and come back from the other side. You'll see that in this heat here as we continue. Now the other thing that you're doing when you're doing that, you're creating a punch spot on the other side. Yes, so because the anvil is flat and the, the piece of material is sitting on the anvil, as we put force down on it from the top with the punch, it's creating a very f small flat spot all the way across the opposite side of the steel directly in line with the top, as long as we're holding the billet straight. So that gives me side to side a reference of where I need to punch the hole side to side when I flip it over. I'm gonna remark it with the scribe end to end, and we'll show you that in just a minute here. Who here has made a rounding hammer before with a striker? Who's made one with a power hammer? Okay. Who here has seen the sequence or one of us, Mark Ling, myself, Jonathan Pinkston, Rob, Paul, do a hammer using the sequence?
I'm using here uh, hammer tongs. Who's familiar with hammer tongs and how they work? Okay, so hammer tongs, um, they look quite easy to make. They're not. They're, they're quite involved in the measurements that go into them, the corners that go into them. But some very important features, uh, most important are the curls at the very end of the tongs. You'll see those later on, how those come into play. But these tongs give me two points of contact so I can manipulate this billet back and forth easily and quickly. You see me flipping the billet around by simply fl flicking my wrist. Right? You cannot do that with something like these pickup tongs. I would have to let go, grab the other side, flip it around. These are the only pair of tongs that I that need to be used in tool making. Right? You'll see me moving the billet around with these because sometimes it's just easier to pull it out of the fire with these. And if I'm going in and out of a propane forge constantly with these, they're going to heat up. And they're 5160, so I cannot quench them. So that's why I'll be using these to manipulate the steel a little bit. But you don't need these. Every, all these tools can be made using only this pair of tongs if you want. What do you use under the power hammer? Under the power hammer, um, I use almost exclusively hammer tongs. Yep. Yep. And here in a few minutes, you will see where the curls come into play making this hammer and making any of these tools. said before we're about three quarters of the way through we're gonna go slightly further that's about good and now we are gonna scribe and punch back from this other side if you can see this here we have a flat that flat spot I mentioned developed on the bottom here now I have two lines and these two I have to divide apart very accurately to line up with the other hole. Rob just gave me what's called a pin prick. Very, very light hit. The reason he does that is because I need to be able to move the mark if it's not in the right place. It's in the right place, so he's gonna hit slightly harder. We're gonna start to develop that hole from this side. If he hit hard right from the beginning, you'd make a mark deep enough that I couldn't move it if it needed to move a tiny bit in either direction. All right, we're gonna start hitting harder. Keeping the billet straight up and down. Just like before, I'm not letting my punch sit in the material for long. It's not soaking up heat. If it gets stuck, I'm quick to get it back out. If it gets stuck enough, I can use the tongs like that to push it off. That's telling me my, my punch is uh, starting to heat up a bit and it's getting deep enough that it's going to punch a plug. So this next, this next uh, hit, if the punch sticks, I'm gonna have Rob give three good hard hits. There's the plug. So here is the hole. That's two heats.
this is the plug. So, as I mentioned earlier, we have a punch as a V tip. Uh, it has a V tip so you can mark with it. <clears throat> so the punch of the V tip is gonna punch a, a plug with a, the negative of the punch. It's quite simple. Most of you have probably seen this before. You can pass it around if you want. So we've now, we've punched a hole. Um, the next step that we're gonna take is we need to make that hole the right size for a handle. So the next thing we're gonna do is drift this hole. A hammer, as you've probably experienced, has an hourglass shaped eye. So if you look from both sides, the hole is gonna taper into the center and then flare back out. And so you could, not that extreme, but has an hourglass shaped eye. Ideally, this taper should be like a Morse taper, about five to eight degrees. It has an hourglass shaped eye so you can drive a tapered handle in that has a slot in it, then put a wedge. It's gonna spread the wood out. So it has a handle that's locked in so that it cannot come out. Some old axes have a single taper eye that's coming, so the handle would go in the small side. Some old axes are like that. I don't think I've seen a hammer like that. I'm sure they probably exist though. But for hammers, I want a double taper eye, hourglass eye. Unlike the top tools I mentioned earlier are just a single taper. Does that make sense to everybody? You've seen this? So we're gonna start by drifting. We're gonna forge the cheeks, and then we're going to release the hammer in a cupping tool. So this is a very important heat, and this is gonna do a couple different things for us. We are sizing the eye for a handle. We are hitting the cheeks so that they spread slightly, so I have more contact on a handle. And we are releasing the hammer in a cupping tool. That action does several things at the same time. One face of the hammer will be in the cupping tool. That'll be forging the round die of the hammer. Okay, one side of a rounding hammer is round. That's gonna forge the round die. The other end of the hammer will be impacted by a flatter. And then the striker will strike the flatter. So we are creating the flat die, the round die, and our drift in the center, that's gonna still be in the hammer, is going to contact end to end. So we're gonna be forging the hole all the way around the drift. That's very important. I'll show you why when we do this. That's a brief description of what's gonna happen here. Can you stack that back up real quick? Oh, yes. Nine inches. Nine. A lot of people ask why these are so short. Yeah, so the striking anvils. Um, a lot of people ask why striking anvils are so short. This is one of the reasons. We're gonna have about nine inches of tooling stacked up here. This anvil's at 24 inches. If this anvil was at 30 inches, um, you'd need to get a lot taller. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> So as the director, it is my job to drive the drift. Uh, the drift is 5160. Uh, it was my job to drive the drift. You should not be having your striker drive the drift, especially not with you holding the drift. It's a very bad idea. Uh, will not end well. So I'm gonna drive the drift. I'm gonna be using a soft hammer. This hammer is just 4140, it's not heat treated. Um, I've driven a lot of drifts with this side of the hammer, as you can see. So I'm now using this side. Um, I need to fill that with weld or something. The reason I'm using a soft hammer to drift is because I want to be able to hit hard drifts if I have a drift that's hard or a harder material like S7. Um, and the struck end of these drifts work hardens over time. Um, if you're hitting it with a hard hammer all the time, that's fine. Just make sure it stays soft so a piece doesn't shear off and stick in you. But you will dent a 1045 hammer hardened you will dent it with S7 if you use it very much, for sure. I, I mean, that, that's, what, that's what this has hit, is an S7 drift, and that's why it looks like that.
So this is where the sequence starts to come in. This is the first nut hits we're gonna count. We're going to the center. One, two. Now we're gonna hit the center. High, center, high. Every time I hit the high of this tool twice, it's gonna knock the drift loose. I'll explain that in a minute. So every time I do that, I'm gonna redrive it. And now I'm gonna hit the high twice. One, two. I'm gonna redrive. It's okay. Every time I redrive, I'm making sure I have contact all the way around the eye with the drift. And now we're gonna release the hammer in a cupping tool with the flatter. Every two hits, I'm gonna set it back down to keep it tight on the drift. It's because I'm not releasing it off the drift yet. I'm upsetting the hammer. I need this to be shorter. As I explained earlier, this action is forging the round die, the flat die, and it's impacting on either end of the drift to forge the eye all the way around. So that heat, the hits that count, are eight on the cheeks. So what we have now, you can see here with this hammer, the cheeks on the top are starting to bulge out, and the eye is drifted, and there's contact on the drift all the way around the eye. That's very important. You may have made one, you may have seen one. I know I've made my fair share of them hammers that have eyes on the ends that are pinched off. That will work fine. The problem with that is when it's pinched off on the ends of the eye, you're not gonna get a handle that properly contacts and has full contact all the way around the eye. When you drive a handle into something like this, you want the most contact so it stays in there as long as possible. So when we upset the hammer in the cupping tool with the drift in it, after we hit on the sides with the fuller, okay, so we forge the sides of the eye, don't just think about the surface of where we're forging the hammer, think about internally the drift and where that's contacting. So we forge the sides like this, and we forge the ends of the eye. So that's why we can have contact all the way around. Another reason you'll get pinched off ends of the eye is if you don't keep the drift tight throughout forging. Right, as I mentioned, every two hits with the fuller to the top, the high side of the drift, it's gonna push that hammer off and dislodge it on the drift. If I just let it dislodge and let it slide down a little bit before I hit it again, what that's gonna do is it's gonna make the eye smaller and it's because there's no contact on the ends anymore, it's gonna pinch the eye out. It's gonna stretch the eye out. So that's why I set, set it down, it tightens the hammer back up around the drift. So when you're forging a hammer, every time you have the drift in it, don't think about just what you're doing to the hammer itself. Think about how you're manipulating the eye too. A lot of people make axes, okay? They'll punch the hole, they'll drift the eye, and they'll draw the cheeks out real heavy, then they'll go to draw the blade out, and then they'll notice what they did when they drew the cheeks out is they not only lengthened the cheeks, but they made that eye too long for the drift. Who here has seen that? Where you, the drift no longer fits in the eye properly, and then they draw the blade out with fullers and it just pinches the end of that eye off. Okay? That's fine, it probably won't result in a crack or anything, however, you're not gonna be able to get a handle that fits as tight as it should in a tool like that. So don't only think about what you're doing on the outside as you forge it and manipulate it with tools, think about how the drift is impacting the eye on the inside. So the next heat, we're gonna do the exact same thing, except from the other side of the hammer. This drift, this is 5160. 
4140 is fine. I sell drifts made out of both, depending on what I have available at the time. I use drifts made out of both. Um, I have made Atlantic 33 drifts. Uh, Atlantic 33, for anyone that's not familiar, is a water hardening and tempering tool steel. You quench it in water, it hardens and tempers itself. So there's no need to, to temper it. Um, they work great, they just, there's a little more wear on your tools and it's very expensive, like many times the price of 4140. The drifts I use for production forging are S7 and they last a very long time um, compared to something like a 5160 drift or a 4140 drift. But that's comparing them under a power hammer. If you do things right with a striker, it takes a lot to destroy a drift. Um, but under a power hammer, I can destroy this instantly if it's in a tool. go to drive this drift into this hammer, what I'm looking for with the drift is I just want to contact the eye all the way around. That's good. So now I'm going to hit this time high, high, which is going to release my billet, so I'm going to tighten it back up. And then I'm going to hit center, high, Center, high. Okay, that's it. I'm gonna redrive. And then we're gonna go back to releasing the hammer. Now, one thing I'm gonna do here, I got some scale on the face of the hammer. I'm gonna brush that off. That's getting really picky. But if I don't brush that scale off, it's gonna get forged into that steel and it's just gonna ruin grinder belts. Scale is very hard on grinder belts, and it's, it's very hard in general. So the less scale I have on these faces, the better. My goal here is to forge this tool to finish, or as close to it as possible. So the less scale buildup I have, the better. I'm gonna take it off now. The last thing I'm gonna do in this heat is make sure that my eyes on each side are the same size. This side is very slightly smaller, so I'm gonna drift that. I'll release that in the cupping tool. So that finishes the fourth heat. And that, that is a finished rounding hammer. You do, you do not need, it truly is, you do not need to go any further. If all you want is a simple rounding hammer, that's it. You have a drifted eye. You have cheeks very slightly, enough to contact a handle, plenty. You have a forged round face. Let me flip that over so you can see that. You see how forged the round face is? Domed, it's clean, no scale on it. There's a slight flat spot in the very center. Uh, I could hit that with a rasp and literally use that hammer. And it, that's all it takes. However, we're gonna go further. Um, when you look at a rounding hammer, a lot of people are drawn to it by what it looks like. A lot of people think it's a really good looking hammer, and it is. But there's no part of this hammer that doesn't have a purpose. The purpose of these trough lines, as we call them, are so that you can get further down in with a fuller to push the cheeks further out. 
you want the cheeks wider so it has more contact on the handle. Okay, you can look at, look at the difference here that these two tools have in how much contact is on, would be on the handle. Like I said before, the more contact you have on the handle, the tighter the handle is going to fit, the longer it's going to last. However, if we take this fuller right now and just drive it into there, it's just going to bog down on either end. It's going to make nasty marks. Does that make sense to everybody? So in order to push these further out, we need to get the fuller down in. That's where the trough lines come in. And the trough lines are forged so that we can get our fuller below the level of the faces so we can move more material out. So that's what we're going to do next. I mentioned a minute ago that I wanted both sides of the eye to be the same size. Here's why. This is where the curls and the hammer tongs come in. These tongs hold that perfectly right in the eye, okay? Very solid. And they also present me with two points that are even all the way across because the eye is the same size and the tongs are forged properly. That what I can now do, when I put my fuller in the anvil, I don't have to look at this to line it up. Stops, stops. It's even across. If the eye is slightly different size, if your tongs are slightly off, it's going to be different. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit one, two, and then I'm going to take a look at it just, just to make sure. Okay? That's what those curls are for. Um, another thing, the sequence we used on these cheeks from the beginning, first time we put the drift in, we hit the center four times and the top four times. When we flipped it, we hit the center twice and the top four. So that gives me four hits on the top, six in the center, four on the other side. So it's even forging all the way across. And that's why it's pretty even. Does that make sense to everybody? We're keeping track of our hits. And this is a, this is a predetermined number of hits. We've already determined how many this is gonna take and we know how many it's gonna take. But use, if you wanna go home and do this, you don't have to use this sequence. Don't feel the need necessarily to write this all down. You can do whatever you want. Just use a method and a sequence. Does this make sense that this method is teachable and then repeatable? That you can, you can teach someone to do it this way a lot easier than telling them, well, it should look like this, now go do it. Or it should look like this, here we're gonna demonstrate it. I like what that looks like, now go make yours look like that. That's, that's not too repeatable for someone very new to this or, or someone that is taking a class, etc. So the next heat, we're going to use a top and bottom fuller. Brief, you've seen me use the bo uh, top fuller. We're going to use a bottom fuller now as well. One thing that is important with this, since we have trough lines on both sides of the hammer, and you're using a sequence, one thing is very important is that the striker strikes just as hard or just as soft on both sides. You want them to strike evenly. Um, otherwise, they'll come out different even though you're using a sequence. So that's, that's somewhat important. I used to only go in the last hole I punched from. And that's usually what it becomes. What I usually do when I'm going to drift something new, if I'm deciding which side, right? If you've already done one side, then you go in the opposite, right? But if I'm deciding which side to go in, whichever side has more material on it. So when you punch the eye down from the top, let me get a chunk of steel here. You punch the eye down from the top, with presses especially sometimes, or power hammers, or with a striker, depending on your punch geometry, you're gonna see the material suck down, right? The material bend very slightly, and you'll, you'll push material down to the opposite side of the billet. So usually when I flip that and come back from the other side, there's more material in the last side I punched from. So I'm gonna drift from that side. But yeah, if I'm deciding fresh which side to go from first when drifting, it's going to be whichever side has more material on it. Does 
anybody else have any other questions? So throughout making a hammer, any of these tools, if you're working with a striker, part of the striker's job is if I'm holding these tools way off, he can say, uh, you're holding them way off. Move them. Uh, don't, as a striker, do not feel like you can't tell somebody directing that something's off, right? I want that, I want somebody to tell me if, if I'm holding something way off. Another thing is when I'm drifting, okay, when I'm holding the drift and I'm driving it into the tool, if I'm holding the drift crooked, that's gonna affect the eye, right? I'm not gonna be able to drive a handle in straight anymore because the eye is crooked. So the striker can tell me, you're driving it crooked, move it a little bit, etc. the troughs on the rounding side of the hammer. It does not matter what side you start with. I just usually start with the rounding side. Shove it in, it stops. One, two, straight. Three, four. Now, that's one, two, three, four, top and bottom, even forging, side to side. I'm gonna roll it up out of the side, bump it over slightly, Line the top up. My striker can tell me if I'm off. One. Two. After two hits, I'm gonna look and make sure it's straight. The reason I wait for two is because I wanna forge it evenly before I look and make sure it's straight. I need to change something, so let me tell you. Wait. Okay. Three, four, five, six. So we forged slightly rectangle now because we did four and then six. Now I'm gonna forge the corners. I'm gonna take the corners off. I can roll up onto them. One, two, three, Four, and then I'm gonna clean up my forging by doing two on the top, one, two, and then the sides, one, two, three, four. So that's the sequence for the troughs. We're gonna do the same exact thing on the other side. Slightly. You got a water room forge. Sorry. Oh, oh <laughs> I got it. You have a slightly rectangular troughs. They don't have to be. It, that's an aesthetics thing. Now we're going to flip it and do the exact same thing on the other side. And it should, as long as all the conditions are the same or close to it, come out looking the same because the same number of hits at about the same heat. Um, I use bolt-on, bolt to the die tooling that bolts the dies, yeah. I've used spring tooling as well. I might use that more in the future. All these handles in all these tools were made and fit in the summer when it was very humid. That's why they're all falling out. Oh yeah, yeah. You set it in the trough and then roll it up. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. So what he's talking about here is to line up. We have 
flat, flat, and then the corners are taken off heavy. What he's talking about is when I, um, to reference where the diagonals are at, I stuck it where I knew it was right, push it over, put this here, and roll it up, and there I am, right where I'm supposed to be. That first one, you gotta know that you're on the corner. Yes, yes. Yeah, the first hit's very important, and that's the best way I've found to make sure it's lined up, is to just roll it up onto the diagonal like that. Walk. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. When I'm making a hammer with a striker, 90% of the time I'm using a coal forge or a coke forge. When I'm doing that, I do not heat up the whole hammer for doing these troughs. I only heat up half of it. I only stick half of it in the fire. There is an advantage to heating up the whole hammer, and that is that you then have residual heat in this side that's gonna keep this side hotter longer. So depending on how hard my striker strikes, how good they are. Um, I may or may not heat up the whole thing, but usually I only heat up half of the material when I'm working out of a coal forge or a coke forge. That can be nice because you, you're not scaling up areas of the material that you don't necessarily want to. One thing you'll notice here is I have not brushed this piece with a brush once yet. Um, the reason I haven't done that is because I have not finished anything yet. I do not believe that you should be pulling a piece of steel out of the fire, something like this, pulling it out of the fire every time and brushing it. It doesn't matter. I'm gonna put it back in the fire in three minutes and it's just gonna reappear. It's funny how that works. I'm gonna brush this at the very end when I'm finishing this piece. So when I go to make, take my final hits on the cheeks, my final hits on the troughs, that's when I'm gonna brush it, that's when I'm gonna clean the scale off to ensure that I'm not forging that scale into the material. I clean that material off, I take my last hits, the material is shined up, planished, that's done. That, that's a method of clean forging. Right. If you're taking it out of the fire every time and just brushing, you're not really doing anything unless you're finishing that work. Now, if, it's, if you bring it out and it's half melted and it's covered in slag or goo from the bottom of your forge, brush it. Get that off before you forge that into it. But when you're just forging like this, it does not need to be brushed. Also, when I hit, right, I hit these corners, so I went top, then sides, then corners. Okay, that's roughing it, that's roughing it. The corners, that's roughing it. But when I hit those corners, they move material here and here as well. And that causes the scale to spring off. That's another method of getting rid of scale. You don't necessarily have to brush it off, depending on where you're hitting it, it's causing the scale to spring off. So when I hit those corners, it causes the scale to spring off here, top and bottom, and then I hit top and sides again, and it's clean. Does that make sense? Here we go. Same thing. One, two, Three, four. Catch it on the end of the tool like that. I'm gonna roll it up. Line it up. One. Two, now I'm gonna check it. Three. Four. Five, six, roll it up on the corners, one, two, 
three. Four, top and bottom, one, two, and then the sides, one, two, three, four. I'm going to clean some of that scale off for you guys to see. But there you go. So now I have knocked, I've knocked that material down that would have, would have been in the way of my fuller. And now look how much further I can drive the fuller in to draw the cheeks out. Now I can actually get down in there and push that material out using a fuller, not a rounding hammer or something. You know, rounding hammer moves material in every direction. Fuller is primarily moving material in this direction to the fuller, right, width ways. Use that fuller to spread that material out, and that's gonna be able to give me more contact on a handle. So, you asked earlier, Zach, what side am I gonna go into now? I don't know what side is what. I don't know which was the last I punched from when I originally punched it, no idea. I'm gonna look at it, and whichever side has more mass of material on it, thicker sides of the cheeks. I'm gonna go from that side. Uh, in this case, they're about the same. So I can look from the side. Is one side swollen out more than the other? Not really, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> so previously when I drifted, when I drove the drift into this hammer, I drove it directly on top of the anvil. But now, if I drive it directly on top of the anvil, I'm going to destroy the cheeks I've started to create. Does that make sense? They're gonna be burying right down on the anvil, it's gonna crush them. So I'm gonna use these tools. These are called hump tools. They're just a piece of flat bar with a piece of round bar welded to it, or just a piece of forged bar. All it does is sits on the anvil on each side, one on each side, and supports that hammer as I drive the drift. That's all it does. Um, these are a lot more versatile, these flat ones that aren't welded, that are forged, because I can use them for all of these tools. But these work a lot better for just rounding hammers. So that's why I have two, that's the difference. Between every heat, you're gonna notice I'm setting my anvil back up. Um, that's something I think is, is important and I, I like to see people doing is no matter whether they're making something for the hundredth time or the first time, I like to see people knowing what they're gonna do in the next heat and having an idea of how they're gonna do it and setting their tools up to do it. And not, you know, a minute ago I came over here with the billet and this was on the floor. Okay, that's wrong. I should not have done that. This should have been on the anvil. Actually, the striker is supposed to set up the tools, but I know. <laughs> but I should have the tools set up. Um, I should be ready. I should know what I'm going to do, be ready to do it. So I'm not wasting heat and wasting time. This uh, really comes into play when time becomes money. So you want to be efficient. You want to forge efficiently. Be efficient with your time, your material, and your fuel. So I have these tools set up, ready to support the hammer. I have them set up diagonally to the hardy hole because the drift will fit a lot further diagonally than it will width ways. So that's why I have them set up diagonally and I'll probably drift far enough that I, I need that clearance. Um, you don't want to get one of these stuck in here. It'd be hard to get out. So when I, originally when I drifted the hole and I used the fuller on the cheeks, I used a sequence, okay? Center, center, center high, center high, high, high. I'm gonna use that same exact sequence. That's the cheeking sequence all throughout the hammer. It's the same sequence I'm gonna use. 
And then when I flip it to the other side, it's gonna be high, high, center, high, center, high. And that leaves, on each, there's three hills, three valleys. On each side is four hits, in the center it's six. Is that making sense to everybody? Yes. What does center high and high mean? So center high and high, um, center is the center of the hammer. Okay, I said three hills, three valleys. Who's seen a rounding hammer that someone made, or I made, uh, that had three fuller lines on the cheeks? Okay, personally, I consider that an unfinished hammer. Um, it's an opinion, um, but that's what I mean. So this is center, high is whatever's high on the drift or to the high side of the drift, the larger side of the drift, and we're not working on the bottom. We, on a hammer, we never hit that one on the low side of the drift because this is an hourglass shaped eye and it's not supported on that side of the drift, right? That's open there. And if I hit that, it's just gonna crush it around the drift. And then I'll have to drift it back open. Does that make sense to everybody? So that's what I mean by center and high. And the hills and the valleys are valley, hill, valley, hill, those fuller lines. And just like before, all throughout this heat, I'm gonna keep that hammer set down tight on the drift so I'm not forging that eye improperly. When I'm driving this drift, I'm bearing down with this hand, pushing down and that keeps my hump tools from flying off. It keeps them tight. I'm gonna go to the center first. I can still feel my mark. Center, 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 high, center, high, reset the drift, and then high, high. That's it. I'm gonna brush the scale off of the faces. See that scale coming off of there? So this, this is one place where brushing is appropriate. Okay, because I'm about to forge this face, and though it's not finishing the face, it's gonna be forging scale into the face that I have to grind through, okay? So not only am I cleaning the faces, I'm also making sure my cupping tool is empty of scale. Same thing on power hammer dies. And th this applies to anything, your anvil, power hammer dies. If you're forging scale in between your material or a tool and the dies, it will tear up your dies. It's, it's very hard stuff. This time I'm not upsetting this hammer. I'm not trying to forge the faces or make it shorter. We've already done that. I'm just releasing it off the drift. We've hit it from side to side. So I'm gonna hit it this way and that's gonna pop it off. If it doesn't come off in three. There we go. So the reason that I don't want to upset it now and push it hard now and try to forge the faces now is because I've forged these troughs now that are smaller than the diameter of the faces. So because that has the weakest structure, that's where the steel is gonna move. And I do not know if it's gonna move evenly. Because that probably will not move evenly, that's where you get problems like the face leaning over, okay? Or a hammer that's, the, the cheeks are over here and the faces are over here. A U-shaped hammer, does that make sense? Bent like that, that's where those problems come from is when you're hitting on it and driving on it hard after you forge the troughs. You wanna get all that upsetting done before you forge the troughs. So now we're gonna go in the other side of the eye in the next heat. be using the same tools 
basically the same thing, except the sequence for hits is gonna be slightly different. But the same as one we used on the second side before. Center, center, or sorry, high, high, center, high, center, high. One thing you'll notice while I'm working here as well is every time I put the piece of material down with the tongs, I set the tongs up here. Or I can set them anywhere else I want. But I'm not gonna be putting these tongs on the ground. I'm not gonna be dropping them on the ground. Um, these tongs are not easy to make. They are very expensive. And you can break them easily if you step on them over something. You don't wanna be bending and messing up these tongs. Um, also, this is Logan's pair of tongs that I made them, so I'll be nice to them. Pretty epic trip hazard, too. Yeah, this is a great trip hazard, too. You know. That's, that's why I'm always putting the tongs somewhere, not on the floor. This hammer, yeah. um, when I made it, it was 10 and a half pounds. After this, it's probably 10 pounds. I've never ground this since I made it. Oh, okay. No, that's that's just. Can I take, I'll probably. Can I take a picture of that I'll thing? probably preheat it and fill it in with weld or something. Really. <laughs> that's just a, a soft hammer for driving drifts. And if you have any soft hammer and hit anything enough in one spot, that's, that's gonna happen to it. I think I mentioned this uh, at the beginning. This piece of steel we're using is hydraulic shaft. Most hydraulic shafts are going to be 1045 or somewhere thereabouts, um, but they have a coating on them, and some of them are hardened, um, induction hardened, I believe it's called, where the very surface of them is hard. So internally, they're not hard, but you can't cut them with a bandsaw or something. Um, you can pick up hydraulic shafts for cheap or free, uh, it's a lot cheaper than buying $25 a foot, $10.45 to do this. So that, that's what we're using here. Um, the coating on it is uh, chrome. The chrome is gonna burn off and it's gonna leave a little green coating like that. But that's what we're using. 10.45 is what I usually use for hammers. It's a water quench steel. It's a very simple heat treat, very simple temper. Sorry? With the hard coating or with the surface uh, hardening, can you enable that and then? Yes, so, yes, yes. So, um, some hydraulic shafts are surface hardened. The very surface of it has been hardened um, in a uh, induction hardened, an induction forge. That, if that's the case, we stick them in a forge and bring them up to dull red, let them cool off, and then the bandsaw will cut them. Yeah, it's like, it's a simple mid-carbon 10 series steel. Like you can really manipulate it a lot by doing different things. Just really simple. You, uh, we often joke about, you could chill 1045 and drop it in water and it'll harden, but it's pretty simple.
Same as the other side. Hit to the high side, high, high. Center, high, center, high. Same thing as before, we're not upsetting it. I am gonna clean the scale off the face. You see the scale built up on the face there? It comes right off pretty easily. So, um, a lot of people, I'll brush this so you can see the, the hills and the valleys. Once again, you do not need to brush it here. I'm not finishing anything yet. I'm just brushing so you can see it. A lot of people would call this a finished rounding hammer. That's fine. Technically, it can, it can be a finished rounding hammer whenever you want it to be. There's still material here that can be moved out, so I'm gonna move a little more out. I'm gonna do that with a larger fuller, a larger radius fuller. That fuller right there. That's just gonna make it smoother. It's gonna provide a more finished aesthetic, in my opinion. Um, that's neither right nor wrong. It's just my opinion that this is not a finished hammer yet. And I'd like it to be a little different. If you make one yourself and you want that to be a finished hammer, that's fine. I'm gonna say it's not. So that was our eighth heat. I said it's gonna take 10 heats, so we have two heats left. That's gonna be driving the drift from each side with the larger fuller and smoothing out and finishing, pulling the cheeks out a little bit. I am... Sorry, say again? Are you trying to chase the cheeks out to the bottom of the trough line? No. No, I'm not. I uh, asked if I'm trying to make the cheeks even with the bottom of the trough lines. I'm not. You can, and some people do. I've made one or two hammers where it was even all the way across, and I just smoothed it right there so you couldn't tell any transition. Looks kind of neat. I'm not going for that, no. You can, that's fine. This sequence that we're using will not allow that, but if you want to do that, do it. Just come up with a sequence that does it. Maybe you go through this sequence, you know, center, 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 high, center, high, 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 twice. Maybe you do it three times. Maybe that gives you your desired uh, look. Maybe you go center, high, center, high, center, high, center, high, whatever. Just, I like to see people using a sequence and knowing what they're doing before they do it and not just looking at it and, and deciding on the fly what to do. When you change the size, no, that's no lie. When you change the size of your belly to start with, do you ever pay attention to the thickness of the handle house or that cheek to the handle hole? When the thickness the of the side, cheeks on the side? Lead, you want to lead how much? What's the difference? Um, you mean? Here. Yes. So the thickness this way of the cheeks, um, that really doesn't, it doesn't matter. I don't want them really thick because then I'm seeing material that could have been used, yeah. right? Um, a lot of farrier hammers. Do you have your hammer I made you here still? Yeah, it's very good. That's fine. But I kind of a farrier-esque hammer, a lot of farrier hammers will have these cheeks way drawn out and that's fine. Um, if you go really, 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 really thin, you just lost all your structure, right? You, you're not gonna have a 
whole lot of structure there to back up the face. So there's a hammer right there I made a while ago. And those are quite thin, but still not thin enough that, that it's for any, it doesn't compromise the structure yet. Um, don't go paper thin. Depends, it depends upon how many hits you're taking and how, how long you want to work at it. Um, that hammer was made, that's actually a really bad hammer to get out. That was made to looks. <laughs> That is not made with a sequence. The reason um, I bought that hammer was that it was weird for him to make it. And I was like, I want it. <laughs> I should make more weird hammers, I guess. Well, um, I mean, it was out of your door. Yeah. That's what yeah. I, mean. I like it. It's very cheeky. Yep. It's a cheeky hammer. The farriers call it wowing it out. I, I call them goofy ears. You know what? Goofy ears. <laughs> goofy ears. With it. <laughs> yeah. So, just like the last two heats and the heats on the cheeks before that, even though we're using a larger fuller, we're gonna do the same hits, same thing. So you can see how this process, especially in a group class, if you have eight people you're trying to teach this to, and they're all gonna go together in pairs of two and you got four different stations. If you tell two people these hits, right, this is something they can remember. <laughs> no matter whether it's the first time you do the cheeks, the second time, or the third time, it's the same hits. It's the same thing, it's, you can remember it. They don't have to look at it and say, huh, I think that looks right, I think that doesn't look right. It's repeatable. How much variation do you allow for people not getting hard enough? Sorry? I said, how much variation do you allow for people not getting hard enough? Okay, so variation for people not hitting hard enough. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, what are you trying to say? Um, depending on upon how hard your striker hits, it, the hammer is going to look different, obviously. Um, this particular sequence is what we use in group classes, and you have people hitting not this hard usually, but from not hard enough to it's okay. Um, and all the hammers turn out okay. Right? They all look different, but they all turn out okay. Um, this is the minimum. So that's, that's something I should mention too. This sequence was developed by Jonathan Pinkston and Mark Ling, two of my friends. They got together a couple summers ago, spent a week, and they developed this sequence, and it is the minimum, what we call the minimum, to make this hammer. Um, any less, and in our opinion, the hammer is not finished. It's underforged, um, but this is the minimum. And this is what we use for group classes. Hammers look different. So you don't like people more efficient. Sorry? So you don't like when people are more efficient than you? <laughs> um, I have used this sequence before and had to tell the striker to strike lighter. Um, so you can't overforge a hammer. So here we go, we're gonna use the larger fullers on the cheeks and now drift in, drive the drift, and now, because I'm finishing this finally, I'm going to brush as much scale off as I can before doing this. Center, center. Every time it's hit, it's going to cause scale to, to pop off. Center, high, center, high. And then high, high. So, this side of the hammer, the cheeks are finished. 
they're smooth. And that's why I brush that all throughout so I'm not forging scale into the cheeks. That was our ninth heat. We have one more heat and the hammer will be finished. So I'm setting this stuff back up. Does anybody have any questions about, about anything? So with, the, with the top and bottom tools that you use, uh, did you make them yourself or, or uh, I think that's like, I'm wondering like how, how you ensure to get the correct print, like the same radius on the top and bottom tools? Is there a special way to create them like that? Yes, so um, all these tools I made, one of them, I may have made alone under a power hammer. Most of them are made with friends. Uh, one or two may have been made in classes after hours. This punch here um, was not ground at all. There's no grinding done on this punch, other than after I started to use it, I ground around the edge very barely. Um, this is a completely forced to finish punch I made in a class that Gilbert took uh, a couple years ago. We made that after hours, so yeah, that's that punch. Um, so yeah, I made all these tools with someone or like, there's a tool that Quad State Mark Ling made me because I needed one. Um, as far as the radius, um, for the, it's a very good question. The fullers, they need a match, right? So the smaller fuller that needs a new handle, smaller fullers are about five eighths of an inch wide and an inch and a half radius. So top and bottom are the same. I usually make these at the same time, a top to match a bottom, and they go together. That's a set. The larger fullers that I use to smooth the cheeks are, these particular ones are about two inches wide. It doesn't really matter the width as much as the radius. This is a basketball fuller because it has an eight inch radius. Basketballs have an eight inch radius. Um, it's a basketball fuller. That's what we call it. Um, does that answer your question? Like, uh, is it just my eye that you get the radius right? Yes. Okay. Okay. I don't have a gauge. <laughs> no. I make them to match when I ship out a set for a customer. They're made to match. They're all close enough. And so this, this is another thing. Every time I hit this, I'm flipping it. If there's a difference in the top tool or the bottom tool, I'm forging it evenly on both sides. If you take two hits, from the same side, one after another, you're no longer forging that evenly. Uh, you forged it out, and then you're gonna have to take two hits from the opposite side to correct it. Okay, so that's one reason why it's important to forge evenly all the way around. Because some people CNC tools, um, but <laughs> um, they're not exactly the same, but flipping it eliminates that problem. How many hammers do I get out of one drift? Um, with a striker, I could get, if I take really good care of the drift, I get hundreds, really. You get a hundred, hundreds of tools. Um, the drifts I usually use, maybe 50 under a power hammer. They get, they get crushed over time slowly. And those are S7 drifts. Does somebody else have a question somewhere?
last heat, you'll notice that there, there's, I don't think there's any such thing as half a heat. It's like, oh, it took me three and a half heats to make it. Well, no. So I've never taken a half heat and then I, I only heated it up halfway. I've got it as hot as it can get so I can get the most amount of work done. I'm not putting stress on my tools by forging it too cold or my striker. High, high, center, high, center, high. Now, at that point, the hits that count on this tool are 82. I said it's gonna take 102. That's 82 hits. I'm gonna release it. Clean that up. Sorry? Not yet. Um, the last step is to go through the trough lines one more time and clean them up. See how the trough lines aren't even anymore because they've been upset a little bit. They're full of scale. They've been upset a little bit. So I'm going to go through the trough lines on each side in this heat. I'm going to brush them first. And I'm going to use a slightly different sequence as I did before so I don't forge them as much. One, two on the top, and the corners. One, two, three, four, and then on the sides, one, two, three, four, that's it, other side, one, two, corners, one, two, three, four, I'll brush this, Hitting those, those corners, like I said before, causes scale to pop off the sides. One, two, three, four. That's a finish hammer. Besides touch marking, um, oh, and handle and grinding and stuff, but it's a finished forged hammer. So because I'm not trying to move material, I'm trying to planish it. I don't, I don't need to go as far. It's already about where I want it. I'm just planishing it all in a dimension. Um, so that's it. I'll take a tiny little bit of heat on it to touch mark it. The 11 heat hammer. Sorry? I have sometimes. Um, I think this is a better way to demonstrate it. That can be dangerous. Sorry? Well, I don't know. Five years? <laughs> Um, I can make a tool set to make a hammer. We could probably make one in 
a day pretty easily with a striker. I can make one in a couple hours with a power hammer. Um, all the tools we use to make the hammer. You know, there's a bunch of tools sitting out here we didn't use. We didn't use a hot cut, top hot cut. Uh, we didn't use a top cupping tool, all right? So, but the, the hammer making tools with a striker, if, if you know what you're doing, you can make them in a day pretty easily and finish them all. These can take you a day. Oh yeah, those, yeah, those can take a day. So two days. Two days. Yeah, in a private class, uh, these are about seven o'clock till noon. That's how long these take. And I make one half, the student makes the other half. In a group class, we do not make these. <laughs> so we're gonna get our touch marks ready here. Touch mark. deciding what side of the hammer is going to be the top. I'll look at both sides of the eye. If one side is bigger, I make that the top. In this case, both sides are the same size. So I'll look at it and uh, whichever side looks better from side profile is what I'll use for the top. That's a bit hot. Touch marks on hammers go on the top of the eye. On top tools, I put touch marks on the bottom, on the end the handle comes in from. No, not upside down. Oh, no, it's not upside down. Is that upside down? Yeah, now, now it's finished. So a couple things to note on this hammer. Um, I'm gonna close this down so it's quieter. <laughs> the flat die is flat. It's pretty flat. It needs chamfers ground into it. That's about it. The round die is nearly perfectly round. There's a slight flat spot in the center. These tools and techniques, a lot of them were um, most of them were taught by and developed by Brian Brazil. Most of you probably recognize that name. And they are taught and developed around not using a grinder. Okay. Um, Brian took these, this system to Kenya, took it to Brazil, um, Brazil and Brazil, and uh, they didn't always use grinders. So you, I still forge this way even though we have grinders because it saves money on belts. And I like to see that I can forge that to the point where I could take my rasp and finish it in the vise and use it. I don't need to grind it. It's like with this hammer eye punch, it wasn't ground, it's completely forged. Um, like the inside of this ball fuller, like try to find me a good way to grind that out. Right, you can't, but it's clean. That's, I like to see that in forging, clean forging that's efficient. So you saw me try to pop that off. It's not coming off because the drift has sucked heat out of it. It's shrunk. Um, an easy way to release that is just hit it, and it'll come right off. Just knock it loose. So that is the hammer. I'm gonna make a pair of tongs real quick now. Um, not done. 
So we'll switch, switch into tongs here. Um, I'm gonna make a pair of flat bit tongs. I regrettably did not bring a pair of flat bit tongs to show you what they look like, but they're gonna look like what they look like when I get done. So I make tongs out of mild steel. Um, I make tongs out of mild steel for a couple different reasons. One, it's a lot cheaper than the alternative. Uh, two, you can quench it. So when using a pair of tongs, say a pair of V-bit tongs like this, they get hot, I can quench them. If they're not mild steel, if they're 5160, if they're 1045, you can't quench them. So I like to make the tongs out of mild steel. It's cheap, it's easier to move, uh, and I can quench it. The most important part of making a pair of tongs, no matter the thickness of the range, the thickness of the bit, what they're made to hold, is that the structure of the tongs is strong. On this pair of tongs, what do you think is the weakest part or has the potential to be the weakest part? Anybody else? Sorry? Say again. So you're saying here, you're saying here, right between that. Um, it's where you're shoving a big hole right through them. So you're taking all the mass and just getting rid of it. The boss, where the rivet goes, is gonna be the weakest part on a pair of tongs. So I make that the thickest part. Because I make it the thickest part, everything behind that is gonna taper away from it. Everything in front of it is gonna taper away from it in both directions. That gives me, and I like, I like a lighter pair of tongs, a flexible pair of tongs. That gives me a pair of tongs. Um, I'll get the pair of tongs actually sized to hold this stock. That gives me a pair of tongs that are lightweight and flexible. And when I squeeze the reins, they're gonna flex instead of bending. If I have a forwards taper and this is the thinnest part, or my, my boss is the thinnest part right there where the rivet goes, they're gonna bend there over time or maybe immediately they'll bend there. So I want everything to taper behind, everything in front to taper forward. This is three quarter inch round mild steel by four and a half inches long. I'm gonna demonstrate how I make tongs normally. I can make a pair of tongs by hand, not with a striker, by hand. Um, I don't make tongs with a striker. I can make a pair in about an hour by hand, hour, hour and 10 minutes or so, if I'm, if I'm demonstrating it. Um, at my shop, under a power hammer, I can make a pair in about 25 minutes, 20 to 25 minutes. It's gonna take longer than that here. I believe I'm gonna use both of these hammers um, together. So I've got flat dies over here, drawing dies over here. Normally, I just use flat dies. And anything I'm gonna add to those dies, I'll add to them. So I'm starting with three quarter inch round, mild steel, you can use square. I prefer round and I buy round because I can also put the round in a lathe if I, want to, if I need to make it something out of round. Round is more efficient or more, um, more, sorry? more versatile than square stock is in general. It's also more economical. Yeah, it's, all, it's also more economical. It's also cheaper most of the time. So I'm also, can you help me move this anvil here, if you don't mind? Right here, where this is at, so we'll move this out of the way. I, we'll just shove it right there if I want. So I'm gonna be using a normal height anvil for this. So the first thing I'm gonna do is forge the bit. I'm gonna use a tong tool for this. That's what I call it. Um, it's just a chunk of steel with the, a, a cavity in the center. Um, I'll show you how that works here. Um, that's just gonna, these, these ends give me a stop, where to stop. You can do it on just a block of steel as well. You can do it at the anvil. I'm gonna show you how to do this, how I do it under a power hammer. And that's, I use a tong tool. Yes? Yes, I, I forged this. I've machined them too, but the, this one's forged. Yep. Just got a handle welded to it. Does anybody have any questions before I get started? I don't 
sure that I've ever used one of these before. So use the pedal. You don't push on it. You hit it with a hammer. Oh, okay. That's what that button's for. What about this one? How do you use that? Oh, okay. The same as with the hammer, but especially with this, I'm getting them as hot as hot as possible with what I have at my disposal. Um, if they're very lightly sparking when I pull it out, that's fine with me. Um, this is mild steel, so I'm not going to destroy the material by burning it very slightly. I just want it to get hot. I want to be able to do the most work possible with the least stress on my machines. Started, I'm gonna forge the bit and boss first. I take about one inch of material for the boss or for the bit. So that creates the bit. Now I'm gonna turn that material 90 degrees, slightly cant it. I'm gonna turn it, there we go. Bit, boss, I'm gonna turn it 90 more degrees. Take about a cube of material, what that means, I'll explain what that means in a second. But about three quarters of an inch of material. I'm gonna run back through it. So there we go, there's a tong blank. Can everybody kind of see how that's come, That's going to come together? Got the bit, the boss, and the everything behind it will be drawn out into the rain. I'm also going to, in the next heat, I'll hit that lightly there to bring that back in. It's bent sideways slightly. Now I'll run through the next one. Same measurements. I want them to match. With tongs, you're not making two opposites. You're making two of the same object. So same exact thing. Um, I did not forge the reins first because I want a good, confident hold on this material while I'm doing this. And these tongs holding onto a thick chunk of material give me that. Holding the end of a rein as the other end of it's hot, holding it with my hands, that doesn't give me a good, confident hold that I can bear down into and keep it there. Does that make sense? Okay, I've reached in that forge a couple times. These tongs are hot up here because they're mild steel, I can quench them. I did not mention this earlier, but the hammer tongs are 5160. So you do not quench these. They will crack. Like I said, I'm just gonna knock that side back. So next thing I'm gonna do is start to draw the rain out, but I'm not gonna draw all the way out to the end. I'm gonna leave a little bit of three quarter inch material, that parent stock, so I can hold on to it throughout the process using these. Because I like, I like to be able to use this pair of tongs to hold on to these, and I, it's just a good solid connection. When I'm starting to forge these reins down, I just gotta, I can still hold on to it with a pair of tongs, but I got a smaller pair of tongs. It doesn't give me nearly as good of a connection to the piece or I can hold onto it with my hand. That means I'm gonna have to constantly keep quenching it. Okay. It's just not ideal. So I'm gonna leave a little bit of material at the very end of these reins to still hold onto with these. So 
I'm starting to draw out the reins. You can see I'm leaving a little material at the end there for that so I can still hang on to it. Looks like it's gonna be a really short pair of tongs, doesn't it? There's a lot of material left in there and in here that I can still draw down. Notice how I'm creating, I'm making that the thickest part of the tongs. Everything's tapering back from that. I think I'm gonna try taking the, um, those half round uh, dies off of there. this down slightly further. created from here to here is roughed out and I need to go through the hand hammer and refine it to finish it. And I'm going to finish from here to the end and then I'll flip it over and draw the rest of the rain out and round it up. I get this one to the same point. Again, I can just quench these tongs and they're starting to get hot. Let's 
So now I'm gonna refine this bit. Um, my boss is kind of square right now. My bit is kind of just a block of steel. I'm gonna to wanna to taper that bit. I do have a pair of flat bit here somewhere. Kind of show that. Somewhere here. Here they are. This is a this is a fancy version of a pair of flat bit tongs, but I want to taper my my bit. I want my boss to be more round. I don't want corners on my boss because as I move the tongs, corners are gonna bind against that joint right there. So I don't want corners on there. First thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna run through this. I'm gonna tilt my hammer. Tilting my hammer, I'm using the corner of the flat die as a cross pin, basically. Now I'm, I'm hitting flat, just running through it. Now see that boss has kind of square corners? I'm gonna now round that. One reason that I like tongs to have a little more of a point, tongs like this, is so that they will scoop something up off the bottom of a gas forge. If you have something flat laying in a gas forge, the pointier the end of your flat bit tongs is, it'll, you can get underneath it easier. You know, if it's quarter inch thick, you're not getting underneath that. Same exact thing. Before I go any further on either of these, I'm going to uh, grind a little spot on them. So when you're making a pair of tongs like this, um, this material right here, you can forge it out too. I always grind it though, or hit it with a rasp. I'll sh show you why here. If that material is still there, right there, it'll bind against the, the boss of the other pair of tongs. You won't even be able to move them. So I always grind that material out. I can forge that out by hitting this way. Okay, that'll move material at the end of the bit and it'll move material here. But I never do that, I just grind it because it's very, very quick, very easy to just grind it, so.
So, you look here. Oh. All right. All I've done is removed a little material out of there, that corner. I've removed a little material here. That's so that these can bind together and not bind on each other. Just clearance. That's all it does. Um, so next, I'll finish refining these and punch the hole for the rivet. When I'm doing two like this in this met this this way, um, you can see I put one in the fire and I've got one slightly out. When I get this one out, I'm gonna push that one the rest of the way in. So that one is not sitting in the fire, scaling away as I'm working on the other. Um, one thing I'm gonna have to do here is bring this anvil back, because this anvil is too high for me to hold this piece of steel between my legs. Um, so I'm gonna bring this anvil back. So after I finish refining this bit, the last thing I'm gonna do here to kind of finish this out, I'm gonna punch a hole, I'm gonna drift that hole up to the right size, and then I'm gonna use a chisel to chisel some grooves into the jaw. Everybody seen vice grips or, or um, Nipex pliers, channel locks, they have grooves saying grip. Um, Flat bit tongs to me don't mean perfectly flat bits. Um, so I, I chisel some grooves into the jaws. Um, helps reduce, it eliminates you having just two points of contact, right? Where the material can move. Gives you a lot more points of contact, so it can't move. So I, I'll show you what that means here in a second. So I'm gonna run through this one more time. The bit, the boss, the rain right behind the boss. I'm gonna finish that now. I'm gonna take the corners off of it. And in this heat, real quick here, I can. Uh, go ahead and mark out for the next heat the things I'm going to be doing. This is where being able to still hold this with a nice big pair of tongs comes in real handy. So I can slip a tong clip right on here and now I, I don't have to squeeze the tongs. So I'm going to mark out for my hole, center the boss. That's marked. There we go. You can drill a hole. That's fine. I probably wouldn't drill a 3 8 inch hole through the center of this. You want to have a lot of material left. The advantage of drift, uh, punching and drifting the hole, of course, is that you're not really removing hardly any material. That's why I like to punch and drift the hole. It's also, in my opinion, a little quicker to punch and drift the hole if you do it right. You may notice when I'm going through this, I'm using very much a sequence, just like with the hammer. Um, I'm doing hits in threes most of the time, so one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. That's what I'm doing most of the time. Same, same thing as with the hammer, I'm just trying to forge evenly. Mark this one.
You know, same thing. So next, I'm going to uh, punch the hole. I'm also going to get my touch mark ready. Does anybody have any questions real quick before I do this? Uh, my tong clips? Yeah. They are made out of pieces of square tubing that have been like an eighth inch long piece of square tubing that's squished on the diamond. So it works in two different directions. And it's adjustable. And it costs two cents. Removing my punch with every hit, bottoming out the punch, or going about 90% of the way through, I flip it back, I see a shiny spot on the bottom, it's stuck, okay. I have a plug right there that's almost coming out, see it right there? That'll come out real easily if I go to drift it. So I'll go drift that right now. That'll come out very easily. There we go. So there you go. Three eighths inch hole punched and drifted. going to use the same drift, I'll cool the drift down for reasons. Flip it, same as before, got a shiny spot. There, that one punched the plug. I was perfectly lined up there. So there's a hole. I'll set that swollen material down, put the drift in. You'll see this little plate I'm drifting over, it just has a 3 8 inch hole in it, slightly over 3 8 That just allows me to support all of the material. There you go, same thing. Three eighths inch hole. Drifting it at a lower heat like that um, shines up the sides of the hole. It's just a little easier to put a rivet in. It's kind of planishing. It's not a big deal, but it, it can help a little bit. When I, when I produce tongs in volume, I do not drift the hole. I punch the hole under a power hammer and I ream the hole with a drill bit because it's quicker when doing a bunch of them. I don't have to cool down a rivet. Now I'm gonna put that, uh, that um, pattern in the jaws I talked about. I'm gonna chisel down the very center of the jaw. I'm gonna do a X pattern. This is just the same thing as channel lock jaws, vice grip jaws. Just giving a little pattern that's gonna help me hold things. Now I'll go through, clean up anything that, that I think needs to be cleaned up. So remember after this, this part of the tong is finished. And I will then I put my touch mark right there on a pair of tongs. 
it's a little bit big. So there you go, that part of the tong is finished. One thing um, I like to do that I do recommend, I'll do that in a second. I'll do that, get this one up to the next, next step and then I'll do that. So this was the same exact thing, just chisel. Like the other one, cleaning up anything. Touch mark. And there's one more thing I'm gonna do. Who knows what countersinking is? Just a little chamfer on the hole. Um, you can do that by using a punch with a slightly steeper taper. You can do that in forging, right? And I do that on tongs, so it's a little bit easier to fit the rivet into the pair of tongs. It also ensures that after you've been hitting on the hole a little bit and around it, it ensures that the hole is swaged back out perfectly round. So now, you should be able to take a rivet, even before, these are just sheared off, but that goes right through there. Just fits. There's a little bit of clearance there. That's very important. Um, you'll see when I go to fit it up with rivets here in a minute, you don't want to get a rivet stuck. It can be a real pain. So I'll quench that. Pass this around if you want. made a pair of tongs before. Who here is more um, confident in your ability to make a hammer than you are a pair of tongs? That's interesting because I sell way more tongs than hammers. Now, the last step before uh, last step before I rivet them together is to finish drawing out the reins. See how having this lump of material here to hold onto has been so useful all throughout it. You know, I can hold it 360 degrees with my tongs, right? I, if I'm chiseling the the bit, if I hold it this way, that's that doesn't work very well holding it. Right? It wants to move, so I just put my tongs that way. It's very easy to hold on to that. Um, drawing it down to a rein and then deciding to, to hold on to it and finish forging the bit I used to do that, it's not nearly as easily. So this is what I've started doing now. I also want to determine what I'm gonna hold this with in this side. Usually a pair of box jaw tongs will work. I also, I didn't bring the other pair that I usually used either. But a pair of box jaw tongs, five eighths or three quarter, will usually hold that fine. Where'd my 
Oh. Oh, no, 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 no. I... You can have it. Verbal contract is legally binding. Okay. So I'm gonna draw out these reins. Um, I'm gonna use a technique under the power hammer called a hit turn method. With every hit, I'm gonna turn it 90 degrees, back and forth. Most of you have probably seen this before. It's power hammer forging 101, drawing tapers, breaking down material. Um, just like forging at the anvil, if you're drawing a taper, you're pulling through the anvil or through the dies. If you're breaking down material, you're pushing into the anvil or into the dies. It's pretty simple. Um, just breaking down this material is straight, pretty straightforward. I want this material to be round when I get done with it, but you cannot draw material round. If you roll material round while you're forging it, so if I'm a piece of round material and I'm forging it like this, if I'm actually forging it, moving material, and not just planishing, smoothing the surface, I will tear up the center of that material. I'll, I'll forge a literal hollow in the center of that material. Um, it's called stove piping. Or... The reason that happens is the material is constantly on the next facet binding against itself and is binding in the center and it tears apart. Does that make sense? Has everybody seen that before happen to you? Okay, yeah. Um, the first time I ever did it, I was up in Alberta, Canada, visiting my friend Ethan Hardy, and we were making some one-inch round stock out of some inch and a quarter. This is about seven years ago. I thought that I could just roll the material, it was inch and a quarter, I thought I could just roll it under the hammer and make it one inch. And I went and cut it on the bandsaw, and there was a hollow down the center of it. And uh, we started consulting his old industrial forging books, and we learned that you cannot do that. So, but you can do it, it just doesn't work very well. Material down, taking small bites of material, feeding into the dies. I, I use that with any power hammer I'm using. This is a 55 pound power hammer. Um, normally, the hammer I run all the time is about 110 pounds. Um, but I use the same techniques, it applies to all. Draw a slight taper down to the size I want, and then I start breaking down to that size. Like I said before, I want these reins when I'm done with them to be round, but you can't break it down round. So I'm breaking it down square. In order to make square into round, I first need to take the corners off of it and make it octagon. So I go from four sides to eight sides, and then once more to 16 sides, and I roll it round. That's how I do it by hand. Under a power hammer, I only go four to eight, and then I roll it round. So you got a little bit more power, and you can, you can take smaller bites at a time. That's how I do it under power hammer versus by hand. Notice I'm holding the material off of the dies until the ram is down. The reason I'm doing that is once I put the material on the dies, the dies are going to be drawing heat out of the material.
So all that material that was proud of this material back here earlier is now getting broken down and drawn out. I couldn't hear what you said, like, about when you were, like, holding it up. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you say all that again? Yeah, so when I come over to the power hammer and I'm waiting for the ram to come down, I just say, hey, hammer. Unless it's a huge piece of steel. Um, I'm holding it above the dies because if I put it down on top of the dies, when it's not ready to forge, it's just gonna be drawing heat out of it. It's just gonna be getting colder. In forging, every time we take a piece of steel out of the fire, we're chasing equilibrium, okay? The steel is seeking equilibrium, a balance with all the environment around it. The anvil's cold. You put a hot piece of steel on the anvil, it's gonna cool quicker than if you just hold it in the air. Does that make sense? So if I'm holding it above the anvil until I'm ready to hit, if I'm holding it above the dies until I'm ready to hit, I'm just trying to keep that piece hot longer. I'm running two pieces like this, I never really have to stop, right? I just keep going. through the dies like this, I'm drawing material out. I'm drawing a taper, right? When I was working into the dies earlier, I'm breaking material down. I'm taking chunks, chop, chop, chop. Now I'm pulling material out. Think of uh, working with Play-Doh or something, how you would, how you would mess with Play-Doh if you were hammering on Play-Doh. It's the same thing, same concept. material was hiding in that little lump of steel. I'm now going to take the corners off. And I'm going to start at the very end and roll. And walk in. Now, if my material is not hot enough to do this, I don't want to do it. Hot enough to do this means a dull red heat. I don't want to go colder than that. I'll tear the material up. Uh, it'll, it'll literally split the material. Some of you have probably seen that happen. off. I'm going to make this one very slightly smaller. So I'm going to take it from, I've started to make it round. I'm going to go back to square to break it down a little more.
All right, last thing I'll do here, where the power hammer forging and the hand forging meets, I'll blend it very slightly. Because I'm going from kind of a, a rectangle with the corners broken into a round. So I'll just blend all that in. Stick it right there. That's fine for now. thing I'm going to do on both of them uh, before I rivet is I'm going to go across the reins and anywhere there's a little power hammer mark I'm going to smooth it out. Um, this, these dies are very nicely radiused. If you have sharp dies that's a big problem. Just like real sharp anvil edges. It's good to leave part of your edges real sharp but with power hammer dies, I want them nicely radius like that. If they're sharp, they're gonna cause cold shuts where your corner, uh, uh, you take a bite out of a piece of material and the corner is too sharp and the next bite folds material over on that. So you don't want that to happen. So I'm just gonna run over this material real quick and smooth it out by hand. Straighten it. I'm not, I'm not pursuing perfect. Um, just want it to be pretty roughly straight. time, you guys get to look at it. And you guys get to look at the finished tongs. We'll talk about a rivet real quick since we're getting, approaching that time. Um, I use mild steel for the rivet, of course. The ratio I use for a rivet, for the head, you want to use about one and a half times the diameter of the material. Um, for 3 eighths, I just use half inch because it's pretty easy to find on a tape measure. I will use a half inch on either side for each head. So I'll show you what that means here. Um, if my tongs fit together, if my tongs fit together and they are, say, three-eighths of an inch for each boss, I want a half inch on each side of that. So an inch plus thickness of the bosses, three-quarter, inch and three-quarter. Does that make sense? All I do to make a rivet is I cut a piece of steel. This is sheared. Uh, I have a, a shear. And uh, that will be made in the tongs. I don't need a pre-made rivet.
three quarters of an inch round, mild steel, hot rolled by four and a half inches long. Yeah. Here is a piece of that right there. All right, so time to rivet them together. So I will need those back. Thank you. Before I rivet them together, um, I'm gonna do a tiny bit of grinding on them, and this is it for aesthetic purposes. It serves no purpose. I'm gonna take a couple little cuts on the grinder. I'm going to break all the edges, all the corners, and that's really it. There'll be a slight bit of grinding after riveting, but I'm just gonna break all the corners on the bits. It's aesthetic purposes only. Time to rivet them. Riveting is extremely easy with a torch. Um, at my shop, though, I do it in a forge, but it's really nice and easy with a torch because you can just hit the rivet only. Uh, in this case, uh, I'm not going to be using a torch, of course. Um, but you see with the rivet stuck in there, they're pretty close already to right where I'm going to want them, right? Um, I didn't compare the lengths at all while drawing them out or the diameters, but they're pretty close. They're about three eighths of an inch off. Um, I can hit that on a grinder, I can cut it with a hot cut or whatever. But I'm gonna preheat this rivet a little bit. So you can use a pre-made rivet, that's fine. Um, I find it much more cost effective. And for the process I use to make tongs, I find it's more effective in general to use, just cut a piece of 3 8 inch bar stock um, or, or round stock. Um, like I said, it's gonna be an inch longer, so you have a half inch on each side for the head, than whatever the width of your boss together is. I know mine are all gonna turn out about 3 8 of an inch thick, give or take a little bit. So that's 3 quarters of an inch, plus an inch, inch and 3 quarter. This is the key to all of this. Um, I use this to drift, right? I can drift over this hole here, that's fine, but if I drift over a hardy hole, um, it's, gonna, it's just gonna pull material down with it, right? The drift's gonna shove material down. This simply supports the material as I drift through it. It's also gonna be supporting the bottom side of my rivet as I rivet the top. See that? So I'm, I'm making a rivet tool here with my tongs, and I'm making the rivet in the tongs. Now that I've heated this up and made it bigger, we'll see if it still fits. If that rivet starts to kink, don't go further. So, look here. We've got a half inch on the bottom. On the top, it's a little bit more than a half inch. All that means is that these bosses are slightly thinner than 3 8 and they are. I can fix that very easily, several different ways. Uh, in this case, instead of using the grinder, I'll show the no grinder method. There you go, now you got a half inch on each side. Just. So now I can, I'll heat that rivet up in the tongs now. The rivet's already a little hotter than the tongs, so it'll heat a little quicker than the tongs. What I don't want is to bring that out of the forge, 
and the whole thing is smoking white hot. So I'm gonna set that rivet and it's gonna dish out the tongs. It's gonna cause them to swell up and it, things are not gonna fit together nicely anymore. So that's not what I want. Um, do you have a piece of steel you want me to fit these to, a little piece of flat bar? Okay. Like I said, a torch is really handy for this because you can, you can do it all without a forge running. If you're doing 100 of these, just sit there and hit with a torch, rivet it, flip it over, hit it with a torch, rivet it. Is that okay? Or you want That's fine. Yeah. Thank you. It does not have to be super hot to rivet it. Um, when I pull that out and start hitting the rivet though, one, I want to make sure that the rivet doesn't go off to the one side, right? I don't want to just flap it over, bend it over. I want to upset it evenly. I also, when I hit it originally, I want to make sure the bosses of the tongs, both sides of the tongs, are fitting against each other flat. If they are not, if there's a gap, that rivet in between them can upset and it'll get stuck and then you, you won't be able to close them together flat against each other. I've done that once or twice. That's fine there. You can see the gap there. I don't want that. So I'm going to put it, tap it down, no gap. Okay, flip it over. I'm going to need to get some more heat, but I've got a rivet head on one side. Next side's ready to head. I don't use rivet headers. No, I, it'd be, they'd look really nice. Yeah, um, but I don't, I don't. What it means, if you're not familiar with the rivet header, it's just two little, it's basically this. Just a dome, but it's much smaller to make a nice domed head on the rivet, a top and a bottom. So just like this, just much smaller. And I've seen rivet headers this size for doing big industrial riveting of bridges, big parts. What I do, though, instead of using a rivet header, I'm um, sorry they look so bad, but I do chamfer the rivet with the round die. So I'll run around it like that, both sides. And now these are locked together. Okay, I don't want to yank on them because I'm going to break them free. Or I won't break them free, I'll just bend them right there where it's the smallest. But since they're locked together, I have an advantage here that I can move these wherever I want and adjust them and not have the reins move. So I have my reins about where I want them to be when they're done. So now, since they're locked together, I can move these bits all over the place and manipulate them and not have any problems. Now, here's a little thing I, I do as well. I like all my hardy holes to have a one inch hardy hole. So all my tooling is the same, but I can also use it to lock my tongs into because I can't turn all the way around. So I can adjust the reins in or out, back and forth, just by locking it in the hardy hole like that, okay? Let's say the whole tongs are bent like that. Now they're not, right? So I like, I don't have to stick it in a vise. So a one inch or a seven eighths inch hardy hole, I like for that reason. So now they're adjusted pretty straight. I'll brush them to break a little bit of the scale off. And at this point, I'm going to trim the bits down to be the same length. These are almost done. So I'll trim the bits to be the same exact length here. They always turn out very, very slightly different. So that's, just hit it on a grinder real quick. And now I'm gonna heat them up. So they're locked together. Um, a lot of people will say things like, you wanna shove them down in uh, a bucket of water and run them back and forth. You don't really wanna do that. There's a lot of stress on the steel. What I wanna do is heat them up 
to where they are scaling in between the two bits and to where the rivet is scaling. And that's gonna cause them to break free. All right, the scale is gonna make, the scale is gonna fall away, the surface is gonna be slightly smaller enough for them to break free. It's a little hotter than this. And then at that point, I'll size them to fit whatever I want them to fit. In this case, it looks like it's gonna be a little piece of quarter inch flat bar. And I will make sure the reins are straight and they'll be done. Except for the ends of the reins. I will, I will um, match those up in a second. Does anybody have any questions? This is the same way I make almost all of these tongs with the differences being the forging done on the bit. V-bit tongs, just a little different. Um, box jaw tongs, you, know, you got one side that's a flat bit, the other side's a box. A little different, some discrepancies in the forging there. But as far as the front of the boss and back, this is all the same. There we go. I will lock one side in a vise and then slowly start to move the next side. And there it's broken free. I don't wanna just jam it because it'll bend right there. I wanna slowly start to move it. Now they're broken free. I can move them. Now I'll grab my piece of flat bar. I'll go all the way back with it to the back of the tongs. And then I will hammer the bits around that pair or that piece of steel. Now I can adjust them. Once again, I'm gonna use the hardy hole for this. I can bend them evenly. I can look down them and see exact, exactly what I'm doing. I can hit them here to bend it. If they're not pretty straight, I can, I can correct that. Be a little correction there. One thing I don't believe I have here is a bucket of oil. There isn't a bucket of oil close, is there? Excellent, okay. So, sorry? So I'm gonna brush these, they're, they're done. a bucket of oil and a rag handy, that would be great. <laughs> Thank you. So, I mentioned earlier a lot of people like you to quench these in water and move them. Um, hear that squeak? Oh, this is Parks 52, fancy. Um, don't quench them if they're red. This might flare up, I don't know. That squeak. No more squeak. And that heat is gonna suck that oil down in the rivet and all throughout there. Now, after quenching them in oil, um, I can cool them off the rest of the way in water. They're, they're pretty cool now, probably. Oil will start to smoke around 400 degrees. They're probably around 400 degrees. I'll cool them off the rest of the way in water. Just so I can handle them right now. Last step, I need to match those two reins up and I can leave them bare, um, meaning no little fancy ears like that, um, or I can make the fancy little ears. The little ears can hold nicely for a tong clip to keep it from sliding off. 
So I'll do those. Just match them up. Chamfer. If you do it right, these little ears on the end are two hits. If you do it right, I may or may not. So looking down them, I can see that this rain here bends. This rain doesn't bend nearly as much. That's an aesthetics thing, but I can fix it. Now it's fixed. Same thing. Anybody, anybody have any questions as I'm finishing this up here? Who's going to go home and make a pair of tongs now? Oh. That's how I put myself out of business. <laughs> That, that pretty much uh, concludes my demonstrations here. If anybody's got any questions, please, thank you. The what? Put your feet and your size in there. Oh. If anybody's got any questions, I'll be around here for a while probably. Uh, thank you very much to Coal Ironworks for having me come. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you guys. I like most of you. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. I've really enjoyed it. <laughs>